Well, welcome again. Here we are at the end of the week and at the end of chapter three, and we have just one verse that I want to talk about today. And it's a relatively short verse, but I think sometimes short passages get overlooked because they're short. Um, and they seem to be very transparent on the surface. We look at them, we read them, and then we don't give a great deal of thought. We don't ponder them at any depth or length. And I think that's important. Throughout this time that Paul's been talking about uh, the prayer that he had for the church, and in a simple way, I would say that what he was praying for these three things, we talked about the inner working of the Holy Spirit, the outward commitment of faith, and then finally, uh, the being rooted and grounded in the depth of God's love, the immeasurable perfection of God's love for us, uh, a love that we often underestimate. Uh, he says he prays these things will be developed in us for one final reason, he says in verse 21, that to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. Now, glory is an interesting thing because I think God has created us with a desire for glory. The fact that you wanna be glorified in your life in one way or another um, is not an evidence that you're necessarily in sin. Uh, I know as a as a young man, I always used to visualize, especially in the sports world, that I would be the guy who would get up to bat, the bases are loaded, and I would hit that grand slam home run, and everybody would be cheering for me and saying how great he, I was. Um, by the way, that never happened for me, so <laughs> don't get any illusions. But uh, yeah, it's also the idea of you know catching that winning uh, touchdown, winning the game, and all those kinds of things that young men seek to glorify themselves in or for young ladies of being the most beautiful bride at the ball. You know, I mean, we, we have these ideas of accomplishing something, being successful, being great, rising above everyone else and, and standing up along ourselves. And in reality, you can climb to the highest heights of this world. Satan offered to Jesus all the kingdoms and all the glories of this world. And Jesus wasn't tempted in the least because he understands that really the highest heights are really nothing more than Bandini's mountain. Now, you may not be familiar with that metaphor. Uh, it goes back to a commercial during the 1980s where uh, it was a fertilizer company that basically was selling cow manure, dried out cow manure. In the old days, we used to spread dried out cow manure on our lawns to fertilize them. And so basically your front yard stank until the water had washed it out. But you could always tell when somebody fertilized their yard, you'd walk by and go, ooh, that stinks. It sounded like a, a, a cow yard. But what they often talked about is this big mountain they had of, of this cow manure, and they called it Bandini's Mountain. I remember once as a young man, I, I had a job <coughs> cleaning out chicken barns after the chickens had been harvested. And uh, that was an experience all unto itself. But my job was to go in there and to dig up the sawdust that was on the floor that had been seek, seek, soaking up all the urine and feces from these chickens for the six or eight weeks they had been growing up to maturity. Uh, my job was to take that and I had to roll it out in wheelbarrows and there was this huge mountain, I'm swearing it's 25 feet tall, of, cow, of chicken manure. And there were two by 12 planks Kind of like going up, kind of like from dog patch going up to the top, and I had to navigate my wheelbarrow up to this this ramp to get to the top to dump the the manure out and then back back down. And the problem was if I stepped off that plank, my foot would sink into wet chicken manure that had been sitting there in the rain for who knows how long. Uh, it was just an unattractive thing. And that always stuck in my mind that the highest heights of this world are nothing more than a pile of cow manure. It may be a high pile, so you're really way up there where the stench comes to you without interruption. That's the only downside of being on the top of the cow manure pile. You can, that's, you can smell it better than anybody else. And I think that's why a lot of people who reach levels of success become disillusioned. They, they, they're at a height where they see it for what it is and they become sad and cynical and sometimes very angry. But success rarely leads to happiness. And so as Christians, our goal isn't to be successful. Our goal is to live an effective life. And that's done by yielding and surrendering to the will and the purpose and the design of the Holy Spirit that resides in the inside. God works it in so he can work it out. But back to our passage. 
And that's why when Paul finishes up, he says, ultimately my prayer is that whatever happens with you will be to God's glory. Uh, that the church would bring glory to God. And this is uh, something that's kind of troubling to me. Many years ago, Billy Graham said to a, a group of pastors in Los Angeles when he began his ministry, ministry and he's one of the few men I know, I know who held true to this to his whole life. He said, there are three things that a man of God should never touch. Number one, we should never touch the gold. I mean, we should never dip into the church's funds for our own personal enrichment. Uh, we should never use ministry as a way of enriching ourselves. In fact, I came across an article the other day where a pastor was uh, selling um, COVID exemption forms, you know, religious exemption forms. He was giving them to people who made a donation. And I, I mean, I don't know what to tell you about that. I, I would hate to have to stand before God and explain that one. But the idea that people sell the grace of God, you know, the holy handkerchiefs or the holy oil or, you know, send in your gift and, and a blessing will come to you and that kind of thing. Uh, merchandising, basically, the, the things of God. Jesus, when he encountered people doing that, drove them out of the temple. So, you know, Billy Graham said very clearly, don't ever be guilty of touching the gold. Secondly, don't ever touch the gals. And, and sexual immorality has become an increasingly despicable problem within the church today, that we have become allowing it now so that we don't, we don't even question people who get divorced and remarried. I mean, people are in the church, they leave, they get divorced, they come back and they have a new spouse. And nobody sits down saying, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? And I know some of you may be listening to this right now and saying, well, you know, God's forgiven me and all that. Yeah, but you did something that it was either justifiable or not justifiable and for the church to invite you back into fellowship this needs to be this conversation needs to happen that doesn't mean that you can't be forgiven but you have to begin by owning that maybe that divorce was sinful maybe it wasn't biblically justified maybe you need to ask god's forgiveness and and begin to build your new relationship on something that's holy and healthy but we also find that with our young people, they think nothing of cohabitating and, and sleeping with other people. All of these things are creeping into the church. And one of the things that, you know, that Billy Graham said very clearly, don't ever do that. And I wish I could say it was just common people, but I, I can count on both hands probably men uh, in the ministry who I once had tremendous respect for and even admiration who fell into sexual immorality. And I don't say that to to put myself above them or to condemn them. But at the same time, it, it's such a disappointment and such a heartbreak. And I, it just really impacts so many people's fa faith in such a negative way. Uh, many of them si simply conclude, well, if they can't overcome that temptation, how can I overcome it? And my answer is really simple. It's by settling in your heart that you'll always say no. It doesn't, you know, uh, one time years ago, uh, James Dobson came up with what he called the 12 steps to adultery. And it was interesting as he went through it, you could begin to see that people don't just simply fall into sexual immorality. They little by little give themselves permission to go further and further down that road. If you begin by s s uh, snipping that at the bud and not letting it grow, the very first thought that comes to your mind, you rebu rebuke it and say, that's of the devil. I will not entertain that thought. Then you'll find yourself not having to extricate yourself from some deep entanglement later on, or even worse, not getting extricated, but being caught up and overtaken and allowing the enemy to bring a, a great defeat and a, a dishonor upon the church. Paul said it very simply, he said, there's some sins that should never be mentioned in the church. And sexual immorality is one of those sins. I don't care whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, or you know, gender fluid binding, whatever it is. Sexual immorality is wrong, that God's made it very clear in his word. There's only one relationship that is acceptable when one man commits to one woman till death do them part, and they stay faithful to each other through all those years. Anything less of that is, is shameful and should be repented of, even the thoughts that entertain it should be repented of and called out for what they are. But the third thing that Paul, uh, Billy Graham said that we should never touch, and he said, that's the glory. We shouldn't touch the gold, we shouldn't touch the gal, we shouldn't touch the glory. And that's where we begin to think that we're something special. Um, many ministries end up collapsing, great ministries end up collapsing 
because they were built on the gifts of the pastor or the leader, not upon the community of believers. And it's really getting hard in this age where we love celebrities. We, we love having some strong leader. And, and we're living in an age where people are desperate to hear people who will speak with clarity and with authority and with conviction about things that are going on, who will stand up against things that are nonsense and call them out for what they are. But at the same time, we've got to be careful that we don't begin to overvalue that individual and begin to think it's them. It's If they're bold for Christ, it's Christ being bold through them. And, and without Christ, they would be weaklings just like everybody else. So the whole point is that we need to recognize that there's this thing in us that craves for glory and we want to be extraordinary. But what should be the thing that's extraordinary is the fact that Christ uses somebody so less than ordinary as you. Paul put it very simply in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. He referred to him as the least of the apostles, the least to have a right to hold that position. And he wasn't just, you know, you know, eating humble pie. He was being honest. It was an honest evaluation that as someone who should have known better and didn't follow his own advice said one time, if it's good, it's Jesus. If it's bad, it's me. And I think that's always what we need to recognize. Where we deceive ourselves is we do something bad and we refuse to admit it's bad. And I think that's, a, that's really where it begins to go downhill. But the greatest offense is to touch the glory. But here's one last point I would make. I've never known anybody who touched the gold or the gals who didn't first touch the glory. They became emboldened. They became arrogant in thinking they had a right to touch things that they had no right to touch. And that's why, uh, you know, there was such a clear distinction. Why did God make this, the Ark of the Covenant something that they couldn't touch? Because he knew if they could touch it, it would be for long, they would turn it into a God and they would make it something that they directed towards their own glory. Well, they ended up doing that without touching the Ark. But nonetheless, that's what happens. And we should never touch the glory. We should always be the first one to say, if it's good, it's God. And if it's bad, I confess that's mine. I own that. I didn't listen to the Lord. Forgive me and remove that sin from me. But let's give God the glory. Let's worship him and praise him. Let's never be guilty of exalting a man. And I would especially say to those of you who are frustrated with the political dynamics in our culture today, that sometimes I think uh, people's admiration for Donald Trump uh, borders on the verge of idolatry. Uh, I would check your heart on that, friends, because the answers to our country's problem aren't going to come through a man. They're going to come from God, bringing the church back into right relationship with him. But I'll save that probably for one of my What the World's Coming To podcasts. In fact, my notes are here. I'm working on it right now. So God bless you. I look forward to uh, getting into chapter four next week as we continue our look at the book of Ephesians. Go in his grace.